Okay, well, uh, before I introduce our uh, uh, keynote, uh, I don't know if Dr. Zelensky is here. Okay. I would like to ask from uh, President Yamamoto and now President Deborah Zelensky to the podium. So, uh, we, we are basically, you, you are witnessing a peaceful transition of power. <laughs> I don't know. There, there is no riot. Yeah, we have the <laughs> there is no riot. There is no, so, so we, we are delighted to have both past president now, yeah, quite pre 20th president, <laughs> and 21st president, Dr. Zelensky. <laughs> so... Um, Dr. Yamamoto, you want to say something? Uh, oh, please go ahead. Sure, sure. Okay, this so, is short one. So anyway, um, you have police officers outside in the right here, so there's a peaceful <laughs> transition. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah I felt a very uh, privilege and honor to uh, serve as a president uh, for the society, which uh, actually I was a one of a uh, founding member, which started about 20 years ago. So um, anyway, I'm so uh, happy uh, to be served uh, for you and then had the opportunity to actually expand a little bit more about the, my uh, field of research, which is uh, cancer research. So uh, next uh, president will be Dr. Zelensky. Um, <laughs> Oops, thank you, Dr. Yamamoto. Wait a minute, and the election was rigged. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, she'll just have to force me out, right? Recount, recount. <laughs> the, uh, thanks to Dr. Kateb for uh, guiding me in leadership roles from you know, the last 14 years to get to this point. Uh, one of the things I want to accomplish with this year is to make optometry more, uh, people more aware of the power of optometry and add to the current standard of care for what optometry represents. Uh, another thing we want to do is to work with uh, policies and try to change the insurance codes so that the current ones used by sensory integration specialists can also be used by optometrists. The codes exist, but they're not used by optometrists currently and um, help the veterans and people get back into the workforce because inefficient visual processing affects so many aspects of life and efficient visual processing uh, makes people be able to go back to the workforce, get off a of disability, cost the government less in um, insurance funding, that type of stuff. So uh, thank, thank you, you Babak and Dr. Yamamoto and uh, hopefully we'll take this organization to next year's president. Thank you, thank you. So let's, uh, let's all of us have a, a, a selfie. Can you all stand up? Okay. Professor, you stand okay. right here, yeah. My signature alligator arm okay. is going at the No, 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 no. I'm going to do a selfie. You stand right here. Okay. You stand there. You stand there. And it's my mastering selfie into play. Okay. One, two, three. Hold on. Is this great? Woman rule. Fabulous. Okay, so um, we have two keynote speakers, 30 minutes each, who are uh, stellar um, in their own field. My dear friend, uh, Dr. Minesh Mehta, who came all the way from the uh, great land of uh, uh, Republicans. Miami, Florida, so uh, to the best place uh, you can buy blues, California Democrats. Anyway, so uh, we are delighted to have him here, and uh, um, Professor Minesh, he, he is uh, one of the, the pioneers in the field of radiation oncology, and uh, he has established one of, one of the finest centers I've ever seen. Um, with all types of uh, radiation therapy machines. So he's going to talk about the future of proton therapy, and uh, we are delighted to have him here. Professor. Thank you, Babak. Thank you, Reinhardt. Thank you to the Society for giving me this honorable invitation 
I recognize and realize that uh, I'm in the way of your lunch. And so I shall adapt the Henry VIII school of speaking. As Henry VIII told all his wives, I shall not keep you for long. Somebody got it, that's good. All righty, so let's see if I can get the slides to move. Uh, do I have control? Ah, all right, let's see if we can do this one. Okay, got it, so these are my disclosures. None of them are relevant to the topic at hand. I'm gonna divide my talk into three parts. As you know, I'm gonna talk about proton therapy, which may seem a bit esoteric to most of you, but this is a rapidly developing field in radiation oncology and in the management of patients with central nervous system neoplasms. I'm gonna talk about the issue at hand regarding clinical evidence some of the issues regarding the biology underpinning proton radiotherapy, and some new developments in technology. This is gonna be a rapid superficial journey because in the allocated time, I cannot cover all of the advances. So why protons? So this is a very, very basic slide. Radiation is used to treat many, many patients with central nervous system tumors. The unique advantage of proton therapy is it's a beam that stops where you want it to stop and therefore has no further exit dose, and therefore tissues beyond the beam uh, do not get irradiated. So it's all about organ and tissue sparing. So let's say, for example, we had a child with medulloblastoma that needed radiation to the entire neuraxis, the craniospinal axis. Conventional photon radiation therapy would treat the entire neuraxis, and the entirety of the body would get different dose levels of radiation. The lower color ranges represent lower color doses, but as you can see, every structure, every organ in the body would get irradiated, and there are consequences to this. Proton therapy, on the other hand, because of its properties in terms of beam stopping at a pre-specified depth, can achieve a dramatically superior dose distribution advantage, as illustrated in this image. And obviously, the long-term consequences in terms of the quality of life, survival, second cancers, organ dysfunction, et cetera, would be significantly superior in favor of a dosimetrically better beam, i.e. proton therapy. You would think with that slide that everybody would be using proton therapy, but let's just take a look at what the current state of affairs in the United States is. These are estimates from the advisory board going back from 2018 to 2023. On the left, you see the national estimates for the use of photon therapy, which is conventional radiotherapy, it's expected to grow about eight to 9% annually from 13 million fractions of radiation delivered to about 14.1 million. In contrast, proton therapy, which is actually accelerating faster at about 14 to 15% annually, is a two log difference from 233,000 fractions to about 267,000 fractions. So clearly, although the technology has clear advantages in terms of dosimetric distribution, its penetration is so low that less than 2% of all radiotherapy delivered in the United States today is delivered with proton therapy. Part of the reason explaining this is lack of level one evidence. It's a more expensive technology, and therefore third party payers are very concerned about the level of evidence that exists. So I hope to discuss with you the landscape of clinical trials in proton therapy, and show you some disruptive clinical data that are driving practice change, and discuss some of the challenges that lie ahead. There are currently more than 150 active trials looking at proton therapy, ranging from every disease site that you can think about, from GU to GI, CNS to pediatrics, head and neck to multiple oligometastatic lesions, breast to thoracic sarcoma, and others. And so there's a whole panoply of clinical trials out there that hopefully will produce level one evidence in short order. What I hope to share with you today are three examples of clinical trials. They're all very different, and that's why I selected them, just to give you a smattering of an example of how work with proton therapy is being pursued. The first trial that I'm going to discuss with you is a trial that's now published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology late in 2022 by Jonathan Yang. In this phase two randomized trial, patients with a very terrible prognosis, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, were randomized to conventional standard of care, which is focal radiation therapy, i.e. symptomatic management. 
or the treatment of the entirety of the neural axis, as in the first slide that I showed you with proton radiation, because proton radiation can spare the bone marrow, the mucosa, the GI, the esophagus, etc., and can, in fact, truly deliver the compartment at risk. And when you do that, both progression-free survival on the left and overall survival on the right are statistically significantly improved, and the curves are sufficiently separate that you don't need a statistician to tell you that they are both statistically significant. So that's clearly practice changing and reflects the fact that in palliative situations like leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, a therapy like proton therapy could have a role, something no one would have thought about just three years ago. This particular trial, BN005, is perhaps more up the alley of most people in this room because this trial really focuses on a unique endpoint. It doesn't focus on survival or progression-free survival, but it focuses on a clinical trial battery that measures neurocognitive outcome that's known as the CTB composite score. And the idea here is to demonstrate that in patients who have lower grade glial neoplasms in their brain, these are the IDH mutated grade two and grade three tumors, who have significant survival probability that not irradiating the brain that does not need radiation, the images at the bottom tell you the story, photons versus protons, protons treat far less brain than photons do, this will translate into a meaningful benefit for patients in terms of cognitive preservation. So the goal here is to demonstrate cognitive preservation, presumably in favor of proton therapy, which would treat less brain. The trial is more than two-thirds accrued, and we expect in about three years or so this will report out. And it'll be the first randomized trial of protons versus photons, looking at cognition as an endpoint, but a very relevant endpoint. The third trial that I want to discuss with you today is a completely unique and different trial. This trial has completed accrual. The label on this trial is BN001. And it's, at its heart, it's testing a very simple hypothesis. It's testing conventional radiation therapy with dimazolamide for the worst gliomas, glioblastoma, or dose-escalated radiation therapy to 75 gray with conventional dimazolamide in the same group of patients. The dose-escalated arm has two compartments to it. There is a photon arm and a proton arm. So there's an indirect comparison between high-dose protons and high-dose photons. And one would argue in glioblastoma, we have looked at dose escalation with radiation for decades and have never demonstrated a survival benefit. So why test it just because we have protons as a different modality? And the biological reason for that is actually quite unique. The biological advantage stems from a terminology that's unique to radiotherapy. We call it the radiation dose bath. So if you look at this particular patient with the glioblastoma, planned with conventional radiation on the left and proton radiation on the right, you see that the rest of the normal brain gets bathed in low doses of radiation that it does not need. This low-dose radiation bath has significant consequences. One of the most unique consequences is it actually induces lymphopenia. These are data from a phase two randomized trial from MD Anderson in glioblastoma patients that clearly show that if you treat patients with protons compared to photons, the rate of acute severe lymphopenia is dramatically lowered in favor of the proton arm. So the red curve on the graph is females treated with photons. The dashed line in red is females treated with protons. And you can see that the baseline AUC is significantly better preserved with protons. You see the same phenomenon with males. The delta is significantly larger for females. So clearly, lymphopenia is a significant consequence of irradiating with this low-dose bath because the circulating lymphocytes in blood get irradiated every day, and they have a very low threshold of radiosensitivity depth. And therefore, lymphopenia is a consequence of radiation. So what? We know from data from University of Washington on the left that the volume of brain irradiated makes a difference in terms of the extent of lymphopenia. So the solid line is the volume of brain, about 56%, receiving 25 gray or higher. And the dashed line is the same volume, getting 25 gray or less, and better preservation of lymphocytes with less brain irradiated. And on the right, you see the survival impact of this. These are data from over 500 patients from Johns Hopkins, where they showed that patients treated with a combination of radiation and timazolomide, if their CD4 count drops below 200, have significantly worse overall survival compared to those who maintain their CD4 count over 200. So the radiation bath-induced lymphopenia 
is potentially a big driver of significant acute severe lymphopenia that results in lower overall survival in glioblastoma patients. Or at least that's the hypothesis that's being tested in this trial. So it's not about dose distribution, but it's about the consequences of a circulating target, lymphocytes, a unique form of biology being tested in this trial. So do we need a trial for every disease once we have a technology? Let me ask you, if you make better steel for bridges, should every bridge in California undergo a randomized trial of new steel versus old steel and see which one falls off first? We'd never do that because this is not a drug paradigm. This is a technology paradigm. You have to prove that the technology is better, and then you don't have to demonstrate it with level one evidence at every potential site. And let me explain to you why I say that. This is a randomized trial that was published in 2017 in JAMA Oncology by Rakesh Jalali and his colleagues from the Tata Institute in India. They randomized patients, children or young adults, with lower grade neoplasms, i.e. with higher survival probability, to conformal radiotherapy using standard techniques or stereotactic radiation using highly sophisticated techniques. In other words, greater precision, less radiation to normal brain. A very simple concept being tested here. If you give less radiation to brain that doesn't need it, does it make a difference? And here you can see that it actually does. In fact, in multiple domains, including in neurocognitive dysfunction, endocrine dysfunction, intellectual function, et cetera, stereotactic radiation was superior to conformal radiation. This is level one data that not treating brain that does not need radiation is a good thing. My grandma could have said that. And she wouldn't need level one evidence for it. Now, we have further level one evidence. This comes from CC001, which is an NRG oncology clinical trial, in which patients with brain metastasis were randomized to whole brain radiation. The control arm was whole brain radiation plus memantin, because in a prior trial, memantin was shown to preserve some neurocognition. And in the control arm, it was memantin plus whole brain radiation, but delivered by sparing the hippocampi. So it was hippocampal avoidant whole brain radiotherapy. And as you can see, using HVLTR total recall, as well as multiple other cognitive tests, the hippocampal sparing resulted in significant preservation of cognitive function in these patients. Again, level one evidence. Now, this patient with a central neurocytoma would not have been enrolled on any of those trials. The patients in CC001 were brain metastasis trials where we demonstrated that not irradiating the hippocampi that don't need radiation is a good thing for patients. There is no known trial that I'm aware of at any stage for central neurocytoma, which is such a rare disease. And as you can clearly see, photon versus proton radiation, it's protons on the right, photons on the left. There is significant preservation of the hippocampi and temporal lobes. Should we treat these patients with protons, or should we now randomize them? If we did a trial, a randomized trial of central neurocytoma, we'd need the entire universe to participate in it for the next maybe 50,000 years before we could actually get results. And that's what I mean, that you can't have a randomized trial for every disease. At some point, logic needs to prevail. Now, I'm gonna shift gears and talk about the integration of biology in the conduct of proton trials. This is one example of how one could actually potentially choose patients that are most likely to benefit from proton therapy. This is a concept that is known as GARD, or genomically adjusted radiation dose, which is driven by a test known as RSI, or radiation sensitivity index, which was developed by Javier Torres Roca at uh, Moffitt at, uh, in Tampa. The concept is simple. You collect the patient's tissue, you process it to perform this multi-gene testing, which gives you this signature. The genomic signature is known as RSI. The RSI tells you what the sensitivity of that particular tumor in that particular patient to radiation dose is, and then you can plan and treat the patient. Let me show you some data. What you see on the left-hand side is a cohort of patients with head and neck cancer who are all treated to the same photon radiation dose of 60 gray. But if you look at each individual patient, each patient is a black dot, what you see is that the effective dose, the biologically effective dose, which is known as the GARD dose, genomically, genomically adjusted radiation dose, ranges from a low of 40 gray to high of 80 gray. In other words, one patient getting 60 gray demonstrates an effect that 40 gray would produce. Another patient given 60 gray demonstrates an effect that 80 gray would produce because the tumors are differentially sensitive. Perhaps we could take these tumors 
that have a lower effect, like a 40 gray effect for 60 gray, which are relatively more radio resistant, and use such patients to populate proton trials to demonstrate who could benefit the most because we can escalate those more easily in those patients. Another biological consequence to consider is the consequence on the other side of the equation. I've only talked to you about benefit. Let me talk to you about risk. This is an example of a patient with a craniopharyngioma who received proton irradiation. Very good plan. Hippocampire preserved as much of the temporal lobes as you could potentially preserve has been preserved. But unfortunately, if you look at the six-month post-treatment imaging changes in this patient, look at all of those periventricular white matter changes. This is a dramatic MRI scan. This did not exist pre-treatment. This is not disease. This is the impact of protons on the periventricular white matter. What's going on here? Is this some kind of microvascular disturbance? Is this some kind of oligodendroglial cell loss? Is this some kind of early necrosis process? Is this a pseudoprogression process? Nobody knows what this is. But we see this with protons. We don't see this with photons. So there's this unique phenomenon that we sometimes see in patients, which obviously is extremely worrisome. But if you wait, it goes away. So 12 months later, the scan looks back to normal. Disease is controlled, patient's doing well. So what's going on in this transition phase of six to 12 months where we see these changes in patients? We don't quite know what this means, but this is the only slide I'm gonna show you that shows actually dose distributions and and curves, which is something we do every day in practice and bores everybody else to sleep. But what this shows you on the right is the physical dose distribution of a proton beam in the solid red line. It's a lower dose as it enters the body and it goes up to a higher dose at the target and then drops off to zero dose at the exit point. We know that protons are slightly more effective than, pro than photons, maybe about 10%. So we correct the dose by 10%. We call that the RBE adjusted dose, and that's the dashed line on top. This is the textbook wisdom that the actual dose is 10% higher than the dose you think you're giving. In reality, we know that this model of the 10% prediction is probably wrong that there are, in fact, several factors that drive this model very differently and very uniquely so that the curve might actually represent what you see on the right with the solid black dots and the solid black line. In other words, just past the point of the highest dose that you deposit, you see that spike. It's the radiological hot spot, distal to what's known as the Bragg peak, that might be causing a higher deposition of dose at the end of range of the proton beam and therefore causing the changes that we saw. We can actually measure this. We can measure what is the linear energy of uh, deposition of this distal beam point. We can graph that graphically. As you can see in this particular patient, the areas in, uh, in, in blue-green demonstrate the high dose around the brainstem. And we can actually modify this through treatment planning displays. So we can look at this, we can adjust it, we can fix the treatment planning. Another way we can do this is through, is through something called proton arc therapy. So that same craniopharyngioma patient that I showed you was treated with a conventional beam approach, but by arcing the machine around the patient, we can potentially cause more areas of distribution and therefore a lower spike in terms of the high LED at the end of beam. This is not a technology that's currently clinically available, but is expected to be in clinic soon in about a year or so. Let me now move to the last part of my talk. And this is the marriage of technology and biology. And this is a concept known as flash radiotherapy. Everybody likes to talk about flashy things in their field, so I think the term flash radiotherapy is appropriately flashy. This, in fact, was a concept that was introduced several years ago in Europe through a unique set of experiments. In this particular uh, paper that I'm showing you here, the investigators simply manipulated the dose rate at which radiation is delivered. The conventional dose rate is about 0.04 gray per second, and that was the control arm in this experiment. The flash dose rate, which is ultra fast, is about 50 gray per second. So that's almost a thousand fold faster than the conventional dose rate. Does it matter? Well, think about it. If you're on the California highway and you increase your speed a thousand fold, what's gonna happen? Something's gonna happen, good or bad, but obviously it's gonna be very, very different. In fact, that's exactly what happened in this experiment. This was an experiment of orthotopic implantation of a lung cancer cell line in, in this particular rodent model where cells were implanted in the lung. 
mice were irradiated, they were followed with bioluminescence imaging, subsequently sacrificed, and then sampling and analysis of the tumor and normal tissue was performed. So here's what happens to the lung. So the first row is the control animals. You see at uh, eight, 24 and, uh, at eight and 24 weeks, um, nothing. The lung is normal, the alveoli are normal. 17 gray conventional radiation, you can see in the dark blue at the, in the bottom panel in the middle row, lots of fibrosis in the lung. The lung is getting fibrotic with this dose. The same dose, 17 gray flash, nothing. The lung looks great. Same dose of radiation given ultra fast, just goes through the lung, no fibrosis in the lung. So flash appears to be preserving normal tissue function. What about the tumor? If we look at sham versus 15 gray conventional, and this is 28 gray flash, the reason it's 28 gray flash is they were trying to go for the maximum dose that they could give without killing the animals, and that was 15 gray with photons, 28 gray with flash, and you can see that the flash treated animals survived, the vast majority of them survived. In fact, they started off with 10 animals in each group, and uh, eight are actually alive with flash radiation compared to only two with 15 gray. So potentially, higher tumor control. So this was then taken into a real world, real life experiment to the first patient ever treated with flash. I don't know this patient's name and probably for HIPAA reasons, I can't tell you her name, even if I knew her name. But she has a sinonasal, actually she's a he. He has a nasal squamous cell carcinoma, as you can see on the nose, 11 year old. And uh, this was deemed unresectable because the whole nose would have to be cut off to take care of this. And so this cat was brought into that lab that you saw the experiment from. And they created a flash experiment and you can see that little rectangle. The skin has peeled off but it's healing back. The hair has been lost there. Complete response of the tumor and two months follow up. So flash radiation, which is something that proton, is, proton therapy is capable of, delivering the radiation at a much more rapid rate can potentially lead to results of this nature. And the first human clinical trials have now been initiated in the US. So I decided to share this data with my pets. My cat was called Tofu. You can see the color of her fur. So Tofu is an appropriate name. She thought that was really cool. My Maltese, who's the competition for Tofu, her name is Lukchub, which means uh, marzipan in Thai. She just looked at it, was totally bored out of her mind, and says, it's lunchtime. Where are my treats? So I'll end with that. Thank you. And if it's time for questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. That was a very insightful talk. Uh, I'm Abhi Haridas, a neurosurgeon from Tampa. Um, I just wanted to get your insight on the role of proton beam therapy for intracranial vascular malformations. Great. So tough question. In fact, there are data. Uh, Dr. Chelberg, when he was at Harvard, initially used the Harvard cyclotron proton beam to treat a very large series of patients with arterial venous malformations. What you do need to realize is that this was work that was done in the 1960s and 1970s, at which time the ability to collimate the beam the ability to even three-dimensionally visualize an arterial venous malformation. There was no MRI in existence, okay? Uh, 3D reformations did not exist. 3D angiography did not exist. So you had big rectangles as targets. And he treated these patients typically with two beams, two lateral beams with, with protons, and actually demonstrated about a 60 to 70% complete obliteration rate of arterial venous malformations with a certain uh, level of toxicity higher than one gets today with stereotactic radiosurgery. So as a consequence, proton therapy has really largely fallen out of favor because the data are legacy data, they're old data, and today's technology produces better results. But today's technology is based on three-dimensional imaging, uh, far more sophisticated beam collimation devices, and really proton therapy has not kept up because stereotactic radiosurgery applications of proton therapy have not kept up with advances in gamma knife radiosurgery, cyber knife radiosurgery, et cetera. Inherently, for very tiny targets, it's very unlikely that there'll be any difference because the targets get smaller and smaller, you don't win on those distributions. But for larger, more complex targets like AVMs, 
there is the potential that protons with more sophisticated planning and collimation could produce less dose to normal brain. Thank you. Hi, great talk. So I, I used to study the basic science of radiation biology, so it's awesome that there's no scarring there. Uh, but my question, which is on the clinical side, which is not my expertise, is I'm wondering if um, I guess the flash or proton might be useful as a priming dose before, you know, later, um, you know, I guess conventional one. It might be a cheaper way of incorporating a more expensive technology. So the hypothesis behind flash radiation is that not only can you give extremely high dose rates, but you actually give a high dose per fraction. So conventional radiotherapy is delivered at 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. You saw in all the data I showed you that flash radiation, they're doing 15, 17, 18, 28 gray per fraction. The belief, because this is only a belief, the clinical trials have just started, is that you probably just need one single fraction. So you could change the radiotherapy paradigm completely if this is successful. Instead of a patient coming for six, seven, eight weeks of radiotherapy, they could be coming for one fraction if this works. That's amazing. Fantastic talk. So I have a question regarding this photon therapy. So in your talk, uh, you mentioned that the phototherapy will cause less uh, lymphopenia in those patients who receive photon therapy. So do you have any opinion or uh, any um, information about then um, what will be the effect on um, patient with the, maybe perhaps combination with the photo, uh, photon therapy, a uh, proton therapy and uh, immunotherapy, like a checkpoint inhibitor? That's obviously the very natural and logical question that arises from there. So we know that in the world of glioblastoma, we were hugely excited by the flashy new technology of immune checkpoint inhibitors because it worked in other diseases. And when we applied it in glioblastoma, it was dead as a dodo. Every checkmate trial we did in glioblastoma, there were horrible results, just no evidence of efficacy. So why? Why is this the case? Is it that glioblastoma is just so bad that nothing works? Is it that the brain is an immunoprivileged site? Or is it that we have exhausted effective T cells in the milieu that simply can't be turned on by immune checkpoint inhibitors? My personal bias is it's the latter. That it's the milieu of the tumor that's immune exhausted, that conventional addition of immune checkpoint inhibitors standard therapy doesn't work. Coming in with something like proton therapy in a handful of fractions, where you can actually cause cell death, therefore release of neoantigens, therefore triggering a novel neoantigenic immune response. In addition, eliminating the T cells that have become exhausted and are now actually supporting the tumor as opposed to supporting the patient, which can be eradicated quite easily with proton radiation because those T cells have high radio sensitivity. And the recruitment of new T cells has not yet occurred so you're not bombing the friendly um, soldiers that are coming in to fight the tumor. So all of these various strategies sort of play very nicely when you think about combining proton therapy with immune checkpoint inhibition. We have treated a handful of patients off study, and we have some very dramatic examples of success. Obviously, this needs to be converted into a bona fide clinical trial to see if this makes a difference. There is one such trial. It's not proton-based. It's photon-based that's currently underway through NRG Oncology. It's called BN010, and it's looking at recurrent glioblastoma with the same concept. And it's using a dual immune checkpoint inhib inhibitor combination. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Every time I meet you, I learn something new. So uh, I would like to learn a little bit more about the uh, ARC therapy you mentioned. So uh, uh, if you can expand on that. Uh, also, where do you see the future of radiation uh, therapy going. Do you see potentially if we have a very precise uh, precision guided therapy, could we use this for, uh, let's say, uh, treating discs, spinal discs, instead of actually opening up uh, patients with the radiation uh, therapy, we could take care of that. Thank you. So, so Babak, as usual, you have one question that is looking at the future, which I love because I can say anything and it doesn't matter whether I'm right or wrong. And the other question is very practical. What is flash therapy? So I think more for the audience, which is probably not radiation oncology oriented, when we deliver radiation from one side to a target with one beam, all the dose is coming from one beam, 
And that means all of that tissue in the path of the radiation beam gets irradiated before the tumor is hit, and it gets a high dose of radiation. If we don't want that tissue to get a high dose of radiation, we would use two beams. We'd come in from two sides. Therefore, this tissue gets only half the radiation. The tissue on the other side gets half the radiation. If we were really smart, we would add two more beams. So we now have four beams, and the tissue in the path only gets a fourth of the beam. We could get smarter and do eight beams, get smarter and do 16 beams. The smartest way to do it is to arc it all around the tumor. And if we arc it, it minimizes radiation exposure of normal tissue. This is very possible with photon therapy, but it's almost impossible with proton therapy today. So this technology of arc therapy is really designed to allow the gantries of proton beams to have the similar arcing delivery capability that photon beam gantries have, and therefore have even further sparing of normal tissue. The Beaumont group has done most of the work on this. It's absolutely fantastic work, and uh, they expect to start clinical trials this year with ARC therapy. There is an ARC consortium of about five institutions that will probably participate in this. The second question, the future of radiation therapy, and you focused on benign diseases. Let me actually focus on cancer first, and I'll come back to benign diseases. Radiotherapy has always been viewed as a local therapy, like surgery. So if you've got localized disease, that's where radiation has a role. The moment a patient has metastatic disease, it has no role. That's where systemic targeted immunotherapeutic agents come into play, because how the heck are you going to radiate the entire body with disease everywhere? But if you really think about it, that's only an engineering problem. Because if radiotherapy works for a tumor in one location, and two locations, and three locations, why can't it work in 50 locations? Sure it can. It's just an engineering problem. How do we solve this engineering problem? Well, there are a couple of ways of doing that. One is to develop technologies that can treat multiple lesions simultaneously and rapidly, and those technologies now exist. There's a phenomenon called biologically guided radiation therapy that is about to be launched in the clinic, and that's based on data from oligometastatic disease clinical trials where progression-free survival, and in some trials, even oral survival has been shown to have improved. Boron neutron capture therapy is another way of doing that. You can target all the cells in a patient with a boronated compound, expose the patient, not the tumor, to neutrons. Only the cells containing borons will take up the neutron, and those tumor cells will die. It's a systemic radiation therapeutic approach for systemic disease. Benign diseases. Radiation does have effect on normal tissues. And can we cleverly exploit this? We talked about arteriovenous malformations. That's a benign disease. We can clearly cure arteriovenous malformations with radiation. But for me, the most exciting recent data are the data on cardiac ablation. So patients that have very severe cardiac uh, dysregulation from typically prior MIs and have had all kinds of ablative techniques and they're at the end of the road are basically told to go into hospice. I know this because my dad is one such patient. Uh, there have been about 100 patients treated in the world with a radiation ablative technique. We've treated a handful of those, and there are dramatic responses. These patients become very functional and can go on to, uh, to have a very fruitful and rewarding life. There was, in fact, a single-arm study done out of Washington University in St. Louis, which was published in the New England Journal, very dramatic results. The FDA just granted permission to conduct a definitive randomized trial two weeks ago for the cardiac ablation for this particular indication. Uh, so this remains to be seen, but yes, used in a very clever way, benign diseases could be a future as well. And I think I'm eating into people's time, so I don't know. Just one last uh, sure. comment or uh, uh, in terms of arc therapy. Uh, do you see a uh, position for um, cobalt-based arc, arc therapy? So the MR Linac is a device which is capable of arc therapy dose distributions, and it was originally designed with cobalt sources as um, the, the source that powers radiation in the machine. And yes, it successfully delivered it, so it can be done. It doesn't have to be an MR Linac. That was just the demonstration that a Linac with cobalt can do arc therapy. So of course that's possible because that would be very cost effective. The MR Linux today now has a standard linear accelerator as opposed to cobalt. So they have moved on and that's partly because of the sharper beam properties of uh, photons generated from a Linux. Uh, 
as opposed to cobalt, which has a dirtier penumbra on the edges. Thank you. Dr. Barron, can you come up and introduce our STEAM colleague, next keynote speaker? Well, thank you very much, Babak. Um, I didn't know I was going to be introducing my dear friend, but fortunately I know him well enough that I think I can do at least some justice. Uh, Dr. Howard Moss is a graduate from the Chicago Med, did his residency in psychiatry at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles County, where we were resident mates. Um, Howard's really one of the most creative, brilliant people I've ever met. He's uh, an accomplished guitarist, he's an outdoorsman, and he is an exceptional educator. He was, I think, the first NIDA fellow in Washington uh, when substance abuse was at a very different place. He went on to be a deputy director of the NIAAA. He was at the University of Pittsburgh doing his work in a number of areas in addiction, particularly uh, as a true translational scientist. We were able to get him away from Pittsburgh when he came to Temple University School of Medicine where we worked together. Uh, he was my vice chair in the Department of Psychiatry. But we weren't really quite up to Howard's level. He didn't say that, but I did. And he went to the University of Pennsylvania, where he ran the addiction training program and worked with Chuck O'Brien, who many of us know. Um, Howard has really done so much superb work. But what has always impressed me with him is not only his ability to be articulate, but the real true translational researcher knowing basic science, knowing how to look at basic science into the world is what does it mean for patient care, for education, and specifically, how does it impact public policy? Having his many years as an administrator and clinician researcher at the NIH, he was one of the people who really got it. And I was thrilled when uh, Babak asked me to recommend someone. I said, well, I'm not sure we could get him to come up from San Diego, where he is now. He's volunteer faculty at Riverside and still teaches at Scripps, where he lives in UC San Diego. But I was thrilled that Howard was able to come up and share with us his thoughts on the opioid crisis, which, as we all know, is something that has significant biological, psychological, social, and political implications. Dr. Howard Moss, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Barron, for that, uh, you know, amazing introduction. This is going to be very difficult for me to live up to. Um, and, you know, I probably should have brought my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the opioid epidemic. And um, much of what I'm going to discuss is really straight from the headlines. Um, and it has really profound public health implications. Uh, and as a consequence, public policy is really needed to address these issues. So um, that being said, um, my title is The Third Wave. And uh, let me explain what that, that exactly means. Um, currently, uh, e epidemiologists are looking at the opioid overdose uh, epidemic in terms of discrete time periods. The earliest time period uh, from 1999 to around 2010 was considered to be the first wave, and it was essentially opioid overdoses as a consequence of prescription opioid drugs. And we've all heard about the lawsuits. We know where that, that 
situation has gone. We know that a lot of large pharmaceutical companies are going, going to be or have already paid large fines um, for um, uh, their heedless uh, advertisement of, of uh, certain opioid drugs. The second wave of um, uh, opioid-associated deaths really came from uh, flooding the market with heroin. And this period of time uh, was somewhere between 2010 and, and 2013. It's a rather brief period of time, frankly. And then began the third wave, which is the wave that we're currently in now, where we see uh, synthetic opioids in combination with stimulant drugs uh, producing substantial death and destruction in a variety of communities uh, in our country. Now, this is just some data showing the relationship between uh, all overdose deaths associated um, with all classes of drugs, including stimulants, and the relative impact of combining opioids with stimulant drugs producing, again, substantial morbidity and mortality in our communities. So, who, who are the people that are affected? Who's dying from uh, opioid drugs? Well, fundamentally, we know certain things about at least the demographics of these individuals. And from that perspective, uh, males seem to die more frequently from overdoses than females do. Uh, the difference is almost twofold. Uh, and we don't really know why this is, but we're, you know, fundamentally we know that substance abuse tends to be uh, uh, more of a disorder of maleness than of um, femaleness. But this does in no way sort of diminishes the impact of uh, addictive disorders in, in the, in the, among females in, in the female communities. Um, both are severely affected. So it may be simply because the base rates of substance use disorders are slightly different between men and women that we can account for the difference that you see in this slide. What about age? How old are the people who are dying from opioids? Well, when you look at the age distribution, at, like in this particular slide, you see essentially what looks like a Gaussian distribution. Um, with, interestingly, the most common age group for death associated with opioid overdoses being somewhere in the 35 to 44 um, year old range. And this is not surprising there. This is the, the, the modal age for uh, opioid dependence. So for individuals who are using opioids regularly, it's not surprising that they are also uh, suffering uh, from uh, death associated with their use of opioids. The next slide kind of looks at the question of are there specific ethnic groups in the United States that are affected more or less by uh, o opioid overdosage? And um, I'd like to point out here that the rates for both uh, non-Hispanic whites and um, non-Hispanic uh, blacks, African Americans, are fairly comparable with substantially lower rates among Asians uh, and uh, native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders and Hispanic individuals. Who were the, the big losers in this distribution? We don't talk very much about this, but the opioid epidemic is affecting Native Americans and uh, Alaskan Natives far more than any other ethnic group, and yet we we spend very little in the way of resources trying to prevent or treat this problem in the Native American community. What about the uh, urban-rural contrast? 
Now this is a tough slide for me because I gotta be honest, I'm colorblind. And um, what this slide is really depicting using um, really three separate colors is that um, it, the navy blue area in the center of our country, uh, those, in those particular states, uh, urban individuals are affected much more than those living in rural communities. However, in, in I think that it's either gray or a very light blue, uh, in states like California, North Dakota, um, North Carolina, Virginia, New York, New Hampshire, it is the opposite where uh, essentially people living in rural communities are affected more than those living in urban communities. And the, the green states indicate really no difference between uh, rural and urban individuals. Um, the, the overdosage rate is about the same in both of these uh, uh, communities. So some places it's an urban phenomenon, other places, it's a rural phenomenon. And this is actually a challenge for those of us who are interested in prevention and rolling out prevention strategies because clearly one size is not going to fit all uh, in these different kinds of communities. So, how do opioids kill? Well, in an overdose, what we see is the suppression by opioids uh, for the mechanisms to breathe. Carbon dioxide levels increase, oxygen levels drop. Uh, this process takes a little time. And um, if an individual suffers hypoxia due to an opioid overdose for five minutes or more, we see at the same time brain damage beginning to set in, neurons essentially are dying. So um, this is what we see uh, clinically. How does this happen? Well, you know, for a long time we didn't really know how opioids suppressed respiration. But it's become clearer now with more recent studies that there are two areas, one in the, in the ponds and one in the medulla oblongata, where there, there's a very high density of um, mu opioid receptors. The medullary center, which really, there are two pieces of that. Um, this is the pre-Botzinger and the Botzinger complex. Translate impulses uh, from uh, the uh, carotid body and other chemoreceptors in various parts of the brain and suppress uh, the stimulus that translates that information into both inspiration and expirational activities. So opioids tend to suppress both kinds of, both elements of breathing. Uh, and this is probably why we see this phenomenon of hypoxia in, in uh, opioid-dependent patients and opioid overdoses. So what about fentanyl? You know, there's a lot of talk about fentanyl. We see it uh, discussed a lot uh, in, in, in news media. What is it about fentanyl and how is it contributing to this substantial death rate among individuals. Well, a little bit about what fentanyl is. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It binds with great avidity to the mu opiate receptors. It is highly lipophilic, which means fentanyl gets into the brain very, very quickly, much more quickly than other opioid drugs. Um, at the same time, it has a relatively short half-life. So for individuals who are choosing fentanyl as their drug of choice, and there are many out there who do so, uh, you have this situation where you have the rapid onset of the high, uh, 
but also the rapid fall off the, of the high. And so consequently, there's the urge to readminister the drug. Because if, if you want a buzz, you need to maintain uh, adequate levels uh, of this in your blood and in your brain. So um, uh, as I mentioned, many people who are uh, street addicts and many folks who are also uh, professionals who've gotten into trouble with addiction uh, have selected fentanyl as, as their drug of choice. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent and powerful than morphine and 50 times more potent than heroin. So a little bit of fentanyl tends to go a long way for, for folks. Uh, this is a, 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 a little PET scan that was done several years ago looking at um, regional brain activity uh, in response to fentanyl. And there are no surprises here, frankly. Um, uh, fentanyl tends to produce activation in the same areas in brain that morphine produces activation and um, uh, heroin produces activation. Specifically, it's the cingulate, the orbital frontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the caudate, where uh, most of fentanyl's activity takes place. But as I said, there's nothing, this is not big news, um, because this is where other opioid drugs work uh, as well. Now, why is fentanyl so important? Well, most of the drugs that are purchased on the street are loaded with a variety of adulterants. Pure, pure pharmaceuticals are not what people buy when they're buying street drugs. There have been several toxicologic studies, and I, I just, um, I'm showing you a slide from, from one of them, where they actually looked at the constituents of drugs that were purchased on, on the streets. The bar on the far left is uh, street cocaine, and the bar on the right is street heroin, and the bar in the middle, and this is very interesting to me, um, this is an unidentified substance that, pe that people bought on the streets. So it's, you know, you know, take this, it will get you high. And there's actually a fair amount of that as well in, in terms of the street economy. So it turns out everything is adulterated. And what's happened most recently is that um, uh, street drugs purchased on the street, such as cocaine, such as heroin, such as um, uh, MDMA, ecstasy, all are now found to contain substantial amounts of, of fentanyl. In addition, uh, the, uh, uh, the cartels have been taking fentanyl and, with a lot of additives and a lot of adulterants and processing it into pills, pills that look like Oxycontin, pills that look like Adderall, pills that look like Xanax, and are sold on the street in that fashion. And what's happening is, is that adolescents in particular who are attracted to taking these kinds of pharmaceutical pills are accidentally overdosing because of the fentanyl content that's in these pills. I, I had a patient who uh, had purchased a substantial amount of alprazolam, Xanax powder. Uh, and uh, uh, he had been abusing Xanax for, for many years. We actually had it analyzed, and it was about 70% fentanyl, had no, no Xanax in it whatsoever. H had he consumed this, he had no tolerance for opiates, he would have died. Um, so, uh, this is an enormous concern currently. Not only do these street drugs have fentanyl as an adulterant, 
but we're also seeing uh, fentanyl analogs um, essentially in drugs being sold on the street. And the most common ones I've listed here are acetyl fentanyl, fluoranyl fentanyl, carfentanyl, and U4770. Now, oh, oh, just a brief word about carfentanyl. Carfentanyl is the most potent of the fentanyl analogs, and it's about 10,000 times stronger than morphine. The little picture on this slide il illustrates the relative lethal doses of heroin, fentanyl, and carfentanyl. And you can see the heroin powder, and you can see a little bit of fentanyl powder in the vial. There's just a hint of a white substance in the carfentanyl vial. It takes very, very little carfentanyl to kill you. Unfortunately, all of these analogs of fentanyl are, are not very easy to identify. They require specialized laboratory testing. And um, as, as a consequence, even though we now have fentanyl test strips that we encourage people in the community to use before they inject with the drug that they've purchased, um, these test strips are not sensitive to carfentanyl or any of these other fentanyl analogs. As a consequence, once again, people uh, think they're taking one thing at a dose that they think they're, they're, they're uh, used to using, and regrettably, they're winding up in respiratory depression and perhaps death. Uh, this, was, this is just from the uh, Washington Post from December. And uh, in mid-December, the Drug Enforcement Agency announced that they had uh, basically seized enough fentanyl to kill every person in the United States. And as you can see, there's a picture here of the seized fentanyl. Uh, Southern California and um, LA County and neighboring Riverside counties and San Bernardino um, are uh, major uh, uh, distribution points for fentanyl. And the largest single fentanyl uh, seizure was actually last year in Riverside County. So um, it probably is making its way from across the border and then being distributed from this area to the rest of the West, at least. Uh, so this, it's clearly a serious problem. I did want to mention something about overdose reversal drugs, about naloxone. Um, right now, what's available to us uh, are uh, three forms of naloxone. One is a form for nasal insufflation, so that when a, uh, an individual is down with an overdose, um, one can use basically administer two milligrams of, of naloxone and attempt to reverse uh, that overdosage. We also have the more commonly used now uh, naloxone nasal spray, which uh, is basically a four milligram dose. And we also have the original one milligram uh, intramuscular injectable parenteral uh, form of, uh, of naloxone. Here's the bad news about naloxone and fentanyl. An individual who is overdosed from fentanyl and is down can be administered naloxone, and it will get them to breathe, and it might wake them up. But within a matter of minutes, they will lapse back in, into a overdose coma, if you will because uh, of the strong avidity of fentanyl for the mu opiate receptor, it basically overwhelms naloxone's ability to block that, that particular receptor. This is extremely problematic. Um, 
People are now using multiple doses of each of these three forms when they suspect fentanyl is involved in an overdosage. But uh, there has been, have been some studies that have been done demonstrating that basically um, you need much higher doses of naloxone than is currently available to unseat uh, fentanyl from the mu opiate receptors. And uh, this, as I said, is problematic because uh, most people who carry naloxone on them will have one with them. And that's just not going to be sufficient to wake a patient up and get them breathing again. So a as a consequence, two um, high-dose versions of naloxone have now been released on the market in the past year. Um, one is Clexado, it's an eight milligram dosage. Uh, it's intranasal, uh, much like the original intranasal naloxone. And the other is Zimhi, which uh, is administered through an auto injector, like um, uh, is used for um, uh, uh, you know, a, a variety of other, other purposes and administers a five milligram dose int intramuscularly. Both of these are now available uh, for those organizations that distribute naloxone. Many are choosing these products over the original lower dose uh, versions of naloxone because of its uh, potential benefit over low dose naloxone in fentanyl overdosage. I want to switch from fentanyl for a moment and talk about another adulterant in street drugs. And this is called Trank. Some of you have heard of Trank, some of you have not. Trank is a, a, a veterinary drug called xylazine. And it's the reason why some people want to use Trankle in addition to their opiates is because it extends the effect of drugs like um, uh, fentanyl over time. So you metabolize it much more slowly. What do we know about Trank? Well, we know that it's an emerging public health threat. We know that um, it's not an opioid uh, tranquilizer, um, it, but it does enhance the effects of opiates substantially. And as I said, it, it makes fentanyl work longer and fentanyl tends to be a shorter, act, shorter acting drug. So people like that, uh, they, get, they get their high a whole lot longer. Pharmacologically, it's an alpha-2 agonist. It looks a lot like clonidine. And um, essentially what it does is it reduces noradrenergic neurotransmission, produces sedation, muscle relaxation, um, and uh, it, it also uh, has some analgesic properties. It is not approved for human use. It's only a veterinary drug, primarily due to CNS depression and hypotension produced by, by xylazine. Uh, the duration can last up to four hours. Uh, it causes soft tissue infections, and I'll show you a hideous picture of that in a moment. And uh, it appears to increase the rate of overdosage when mixed in with street opioids. The bad news is because it's not an opioid and doesn't bind to the mu opioid receptor, naloxone does not um, reverse the effects of Trank. But we're seeing more and more of it. This is a uh, MRI of, uh, uh, of a, a man, actually, who was a chronic xylazine, chronic trank abuser. And we see that it clearly has on its own some neurotoxic effects. It produces cortical atrophy um, and uh, volume loss in brain. So it's not a great drug. Unfortunately, on the East Coast primarily, 
it is becoming increasingly prevalent in, uh, in association with fentanyl-related overdose deaths. And you know, places like Maryland, Philadelphia, um, and Chicago uh, are reporting deaths associated with fentanyl plus xylazine. I mentioned that it produces um, some uh, necrotic skin lesions. This is the ankle of a patient who was shooting cocaine and xylazine together. Why that combination? Once again, uh, xylazine produces vasoconstriction. Um, it makes the high last longer, but that vasoconstriction also produces tissue necrosis. So this is frightening stuff, obviously. What can we do to intervene? What, what, what are the public health policies that can help reverse this? There is some good news in this picture, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So from the, the focus of um, harm reduction, we need broader distribution of naloxone to patients, families, and the community at large. It looks like this is going to happen. Uh, in the past week, two FDA committees have approved naloxone for over-the-counter sales. So previously, it was prescription only. We now may be able to get folks to be able to purchase it uh, in, in their local pharmacy. Good news, bad news, still expensive stuff, relatively speaking, for the, the common individual. And the high-dose naloxone is more expensive than the low-dose naloxone. Nonetheless, we're moving in a positive direction. We also need to increase the availability of fentanyl test strips. Within the uh, um, opiate addiction community, people are increasingly testing the drugs that they're buying on the streets to make sure that they don't contain fentanyl or I might add in some cases to make sure that it does contain fentanyl. Nonetheless, these um, uh, test strips are extremely helpful and they're much easier to use than um, the standard urine drug screen that most of us who do addiction work are familiar with. We also need to increase syringe service programs. The, um, the, these are needle exchange programs. The good news about individuals who participate uh, in these clean needle programs is that they are five times more likely than folks who do not to ultimately seek treatment for opiate dependence. So this is important and it's valuable. We also need to be able to expand safe injection sites. These, the data that's out there for those jurisdictions that have safe uh, injection sites shows that essentially they almost completely eliminate drug overdose uh, dosage associated with opiate use. Um, so that's important because we're, we need to really think about saving lives. Uh, you can't get treatment if you're dead. Um, so our, our, our goal here in harm, harm reduction is to save people's lives Hopefully, at some time, they will enter in, into treatment. Uh, in terms of addiction treatment, we need to expand the, the availability of med, uh, medication-assisted therapies like Suboxone. This is also uh, on a positive trajectory. Um, the current administration has done away with the X waiver, so any licensed physician can now prescribe Suboxone, and there are also people who are willing to mentor folks who've never used this before so that they understand the utility of, uh, of uh, Suboxone. So the X waiver is now gone. Importantly, we need to keep our focus on medicalizing and destigmatizing opioid dependence. It's not a shame. It's just a disease, and it's no different from any of the other diseases we treat our patients for. The more we can destigmatize it, the more people are willing to go into treatment. 
What else? Well, we need to support the DEA's effort at interdiction and limiting the drug supply. And we need better and easily accessible data on adulterates in street drugs, such as xylazine and some of the uh, fentanyl analogs. So that's what, that's what we have available to us now. These are the tools that we have. I'm, I'm very pleased that our national drug policy sees some uh, measure of wisdom in accepting some of these recommendations, not all. They are politically sensitive. But I look forward to that, those curves I showed at the beginning to having a downward trend sometime in the future. And I thank you. Do we have time for questions? Anybody have any? No? OK, thank you. You know, there, there's, there's a, a, a physician named Andrew Weil who's written several books. The best is, I think, called The Natural Mind. And he basically argues that human beings have always looked for ways to alter their consciousness. Perhaps what we're dealing with is a natural drive. There's never been a time in history when people did not take substances of various sorts to alter the way they were feeling, thinking, and what their mood states were like. I don't think we can prevent uh, experimentation with drugs of abuse as much as I'd like to say we can. But what we can do is we can diminish the adverse consequences, and I think that's our job. Because mm -hmm. I, I had been taught as a kid, don't touch these drugs. And I didn't. I, I decided to go to take a physiological psychology class, find out what they did in the brain, and end up being a psychiatrist. Maybe that's a worse fate, I don't know. <laughs> I've been doing prevention research for 35 years, and I can tell you that the effect sizes for most of the prevention interventions that work, that work, are modest at best, and they're not enduring. Um, you know, per, perhaps we've been doing the wrong things, following the wrong strategies, but um, I tend to be more skeptical about just say no. It, it really hasn't worked so far. It's more than just say no. People have to learn early on. Part of our education system is to teach them the wisdom of drugs. It's not taught at all in school. Uh, uh, oh, it has been, it has been taught, like taught in schools system. substantially. Well, we disagree on, on this matter. It, it's much, it's harder than I, I think you uh, appreciate. Yes? Is the mic work? I don't know. <laughs> I'll find out. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I have an a observation and not necessarily a solution, but at one point when I was doing some teen talk groups uh, in the Santa Clarita community, um, the kids showed up and they were just rather odd in their behavior. They just seemed to be picking at things uh, focusing attention on really small things and kind of tearing apart the room. Mm. So when uh, we fi I finally got them to sit down and start talking, one of the things they said to me that struck me so deeply, they all said, the only time I feel okay in my life is when I'm, I'm high, high on drugs. And to me, that's a huge developmental problem that somehow they're not adored, uh, loved unconditionally, and cared about by their parents, that the only thing that matters to them 
is when they're high, and that's a huge problem. I don't know where to start with that, but that incident has just rung with me for the last 20 years yeah. in terms of my practice. I appreciate what you're doing, and uh, <clears throat> this was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. We, we, we published a paper last year on the association between adverse childhood experiences and uh, substance use disorders, specifically. There is definitely an, an association there, but there's also an association between adverse childhood and experiences and a variety of psychopathology ranging from major depression to PTSD to even psychotic disorders. Adverse childhood experiences do change brain development. They alter the wiring of the brain and um, they alter the brain's ability to respond to environmental stresses. Can we eliminate adverse childhood experiences? You know, that would be wonderful. That, you know, um, but you know, I, I, that's a big task. And, and it's something that, that you know, it, can we eliminate bad parenting? Uh, you know, years ago, people uh, suggested that you needed a license to be a parent. You should go through a course, you should take a test. If you can drive on the street, you should be able to um, take a test to become a good parent. Comments, a couple questions. Sure. Um, one, you, you spoke initially about how people, the reasons people were choosing to take fentanyl, and then later talked about how uh, many drugs and in different ways the cartel and other drug organizations were lacing drugs with fentanyl. Yes. I'd be really curious if you know any statistics on what percentage of fentanyl overdoses actually know they're taking fentanyl. Oh, prior to overdose. It's, it's interesting data. I don't, I've, I've never, well, first of all, the fatal overdoses, you can't actually go back and ask them what they thought they were taking. No, but that's problematic. There's, you know, it's a social thing. In yeah. The, uh, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure I, there's some projected statistics. I, I can least. tell you I've had patients who would take the uh, pharmaceutical fentanyl strips, open them up, take the gel, slap it onto a piece, of aluminum foil, heat it, and, and huff it, uh, and, and get the, the fentanyl fumes that way. So, you know, for those individuals, it was clear that they wanted fentanyl and that they used fentanyl. Right. Um, but in terms of deaths, there's really no way to know. Okay, and then a couple other observations and then one more question. Um, the one slide you showed with the discrepancy between male and female overdoses. Yes. I think, um, to me, something jumps out immediately, especially you know if you adjust them for actual addiction rates, it's still males are much higher. And to me, it seems relatively simple, and this is probably, I think, what you would call anecdotal as opposed to statistical, but um, men are basically more likely, let's say they have an addiction, they're more likely to be okay with seeking out an illicit drug you know, in an alley by a dumpster from somebody they don't know, whereas females are, the fear of, of a sexual assault or something like that is gonna drive them more to try to feed that addiction through safer means like trying to get a fraudulent prescription or something like that. So I would say that that's possibly a reason for that difference. And then you show the map of the United States mm -hmm. with the uh, relations between rural and urban, urban. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember if it was addiction or overdose that it was showing, but the- uh, Oh, it was overdose. Okay, so overdose, and to me, what immediately jumped out at me about that map is that the areas in blue were clearly states in which uh, there's a lot of rural industrialization, aka agriculture, livestock, stuff like that. Whereas the states like California, although we do have a, a large uh, agricultural industry, a lot of those states, rural, the rural areas are not industrialized. So essentially, people who are getting up to go to work, whether they're in urban areas, or rural areas are less likely to be uh, addicted to drugs and taking drugs as opposed to areas where rural uh, communities are not industrialized, 
they're much likely to have less likely to have a job and more likely to be using recreational drugs like she that. You might be basis. right, and there's data there that we could probably analyze in that direction to see whether your hypothesis actually holds true. And then the last thing I have is what about the role and the responsibility of actually the medical and specifically the pharmaceutical community, the pharmaceutical community being the biggest lobbying body now in the United States replaced by what was once tobacco. Uh, you know, essentially the biggest lobbying body, if you look at it, tends to almost always be whatever industry is seeking out a license to get away with murder. Uh, and what about the responsibility of the pharmaceutical industry to create the financial demand to drive things like the creation of new and more extreme and more extreme and more extreme pharmaceuticals and opiates and to propagate them as well. I mean, the, I guarantee you the cartel's not coming up with fentanyl on their own. They're stealing it from the pharmaceutical industry which is driven by the dollars which are made available by the medical community and because the lobbyists, the, the politicians allow them to because of the campaign contributions that the pharmaceutical industry makes. I mean, there's gotta be some responsibility there, at least as much as good parenting and a lack of childhood trauma. I, you know, ag agree. And also, um, you. you know, let's face it, that's now an issue that's been established by in, in court and big pharma who, who has found to be culpable in, in these matters has had its hands slapped and forced to pay substantial amounts of penalties. Um, those funds are now being turned around into um, uh, programs that either prevent substance abuse, prevent overdosage, or um, enhance treatment for individuals who are already dependent. So you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of elements of, of American society that are guilty. Anything else? Okay, thank you.